Good. Well, everyone in our legal community knows Corky Goldstein, and I am so pleased to be talking to you this afternoon here at the Dauphin County Bar Association. So first of all, Corky, I'd like to have you talk a little bit about your childhood in Harrisburg. Well, I was born in uptown Harrisburg. Mm -hmm. um, I had, had, there were three boys, I had two brothers, a younger and an older and my mom and dad, and uh, my father was a realtor. Mm -hmm. uh, his parents had come over from Poland, and uh, their name wasn't Goldstein. Mm -hmm. Their name, the grandparents' name were Marinic, mm -hmm. but when they came here, they lived with the, a Goldstein family, and maybe back then they just took that name. Interesting. Uh, and then, uh, my, that was my father's parents. They had five children. Mm -hmm. And so when I grew up, my grandparents lived there, my uncles. But my mother is from, was from New York City. Mm -hmm. And my father was up there on a real estate development deal. And he met my mother. Someone fixed them up. Mm -hmm. And make a long story short, then she moved here. And at first she wasn't sure whether we had outdoor plumbing. <laughs> In but, Harrisburg. Yeah, but that's how New York people think. And, uh, but she made a great life here, and I had a great childhood. I went to the city public schools mm -hmm. uh, and graduated from William Penn High School, the public school. And uh, I loved it. I really loved that. And uh, what a great place to grow up in Harrisburg. Mm -hmm. I mean, we didn't have what they have today, some of the things, but. We had a great time. Mm -hmm. The expense of living mm -hmm. back then, your dollars went a lot further than the, you know they do when you're in the big city. Mm -hmm. and, and from what I hear from others who grew up in the Harrisburg area, Corky, such a strong sense of community. Oh yeah, we we all lived near each other. Mm -hmm. Just about we could walk, mm -hmm. and uh, honestly, it was a different world. Mm -hmm than today. I mean, there was no real division in, in terms of religion or in terms of race mm -hmm. or, or that. I mean, uh, it was just, an, and the worst thing that happened in schools, for the most part, mm -hmm. were maybe fights, That's physical right. fights. That's right. I mean, there were no guns, there were no the, the harsh kind of things like we have today. Mm -hmm. There were fights and they were broken up. Mm -hmm. Uh, juvenile court back then mm -hmm. was like once a month. <laughs> yes, and in not Dauphin all day County. long every day. You know what I mean? And it was uh, unfortunate, those from some of the toughest backgrounds mm -hmm. and generally were the ones getting themselves unfortunately in difficulty, but other people, they, they weren't. You didn't see them there. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately that has changed and I think a lot of that, and I think people realize that a lot of that has to do with drugs mm -hmm. that entered our st the, the, every all over mm -hmm. and also with there's other things I happen to think some of the harsh video games mm -hmm. that people play mm -hmm. and the exposure mm -hmm. that's the downside of the internet so to speak has changed mm -hmm. many of the kids today when my kids were 16 my daughters, two daughters. They were not as far advanced in the world in any way mm -hmm. as a 16 year old girl or boy today. Mm -hmm. Some of it's good mm -hmm. and some of it's pretty mm -hmm. dark side of the, of the internet. Mm -hmm. But so I would say I had a wonderful childhood mm -hmm. here. I loved every minute of it mm -hmm. and I was very active in the school. Mm -hmm. um, Corky, where did you go to undergrad? I went to Penn State University, mm -hmm. which my father never forgave me. And tell, tell me why. My father was first in his class mm -hmm. at University of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And my father was, and graduated there in 1918. Oh, wow. But, and my father was a concert pianist, <gasps> besides being a realtor, but mm -hmm. eventually, but uh, I had, Sent, a, sent an application into, to at that time to, to uh, Cornell, mm -hmm. and I got in. Mm -hmm. 
but I wanted a Big Ten school, mm -hmm. and I knew so many people at Penn State. Mm -hmm. So when I went to Cornell, I didn't really know anybody. I, maybe I was very immature, of course. When I went to Penn State, I knew the other people, and I felt at home. Mm -hmm. And my father was always mad at me for not going to Cornell. He thought that would have been a, a better spot for me. Broadening your horizon. Yeah, he said, yeah, to get out of the area and that. But mm -hmm. I went to Penn State University, and as you would well aware, I would, when I got up there, there was like 6,000 in my freshman class, mm -hmm. and I, uh, my roommate mm -hmm. was Herbert Nurick. Oh, I didn't know you were roommates. Yeah, we, our Herbert. first year, because oh. Herbert and I grew up together, mm -hmm. and of course Herb's father, Gilbert Nurick, mm -hmm. one of the most brilliant men in this community, mm -hmm. and Central Pennsylvania, and brilliant lawyer in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Gilbert Nurick uh, and two other men started, McNeese, Swallows, and Nurick. Mm -hmm which became a huge firm. Mm -hmm. Their first client was a pretty good client to get, mm -hmm. which was all of Hershey. Hershey, uh, Hershey Company. Hershey Company, Hershey Food, mm -hmm. the trust. Mm -hmm. Because back then, Hershey didn't have, which is somewhat unbelievable, all these different things. Hershey didn't have any in-house counsel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Their counsel was McNeese, mm -hmm. Wallace and Nurek. And you know, having that as a base to start a law firm, where you can go from there. Nice building blocks. Yeah, and Gilbert Nurek, to me, was like an Abe Lincoln, mm -hmm. very tall. Mm -hmm. When he walked in anywhere, he was, people just, you know. He commanded the room. Yeah, but just by his looks mm -hmm. and his soft, the way he talked. Mm -hmm. Plus everybody knew, though, he was a brilliant lawyer mm -hmm. and a very kind man. Mm -hmm. And he became he at one he became the president of the Pennsylvania Bar Association. Yes. yes. And uh, in fact, I think you were the recipient I, of one of his awards. Absolutely, Corky. I was given the Nurek Award last year by the PBA at uh, the county conference of bar leaders, and it was an honor for me uh, in so many ways. But also because when I first moved. To Harrisburg, the first lawyer I met in Harrisburg was Herb Nurek, and so this was very, very meaningful for me. So Penn State undergrad, and then how did you decide that law was going to be your next step? Well, while I was at Penn State, I wanted to. My thought was going into. maybe reporting the news, mm -hmm. being on television. Mm -hmm. I was in many shows, many plays, mm -hmm. and I was very active in student government, mm -hmm. and very active in, uh, you know, because being president of the class, you were active in the student government, mm -hmm. and then by my senior year, I was honored by being uh, brought into what's called the Lion's Paw Society. Mm -hmm which I can humbly say is the one of the greatest awards to get at Penn State, mm -hmm. a lion's paw. And uh, I was that the whole senior year. It's like a, it's not, it's not secret that it exists, but it's secret who's in it. Mm -hmm. And we met on Sunday nights and all the heads of different things were up there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was in a fraternity and fraternity life back then was much different than it is today. And it's unfortunate. I'm not saying things didn't go on, mm -hmm. but nothing to the extent that we see today. Yes. And uh, it upsets me to see that because mm -hmm. at one time it served a great purpose. I don't know if it's still serving the purpose that it mm -hmm. should. Mm -hmm. But after Penn State, uh, my father had, as I said, wanted me to, I wanted to go into take courses on television production and things like that. And I was in shows and I was thinking maybe I would go into acting or something, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, then uh, my father said, you know, I'm sending you to Penn, to Penn State, okay? And I'll pay for it. Well, you're, gonna, you're going to take courses that will prepare you for law school. Mm -hmm. So I took those courses mm -hmm. and his position, and 
he turned out to be right. Mm -hmm. He said, look, I'd like you to become a lawyer because then you'll, and get your license, because then you'll always have an ability to make a living. Mm -hmm. But, and I know you will love it because you've, that's your personality. Yes. And I think you will love it. The other things you're talking about, I'm not saying they're not fun or they're not exciting work, value. but and I was mentioning this to someone just before we sat down, that the world of acting and film production and all that, there's no real direction. You go to law school, you get a job and you move on. Mm -hmm. When you're in the film world, it's like trying to pin jello to the wall, yes. you know, yes. that kind of thing. A but little anybody, less precise. Yeah, so I went to, uh, so I took a year off because I wasn't okay. sure where I wanted to go. Mm -hmm. And I worked for what is the D&H Distributing Company, mm -hmm. which is still here in Harrisburg. Yes. And I'm very good with the Schwab family that yes. owns D&H yes. and is now, a, well now it's a uh, employee-owned employee company and I think most people know that it Last year it did $3.8 billion. Exactly. They kept reinventing themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then during that year, as I was working for them to try and get my head together mm -hmm. at that age, I said, you know what, I do want to go to law school. Mm -hmm. So I applied to Dickinson Law mm -hmm. and I got in mm -hmm. and then I got into Dickinson Law mm -hmm. and I lived in Carlisle, Pennsylvania mm -hmm. for three years. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I was very fortunate to get what they call the John D. Keith Memorial Scholarship for my work mm -hmm. and that paid for my room mm -hmm. and uh, most of my tuition, mm -hmm. which was very little back then even. Mm -hmm. So I lived in next, and I had to live in the dormitory mm -hmm. that was next door. It was called the Sadler Curtilage mm -hmm. and uh, that was just for single guys okay. or married guys whose wives didn't live there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there were usually maybe 80 to 90 mm -hmm. young men living in there. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all gone now, the yes. Sadler Curlage. Yeah. But that's where I lived because I was part of the scholarship to live there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't love law school, but I didn't hate it. Mm -hmm. It was a lot of work. Yeah. Burton Laub had been a common pleas judge mm -hmm. in Erie County. Okay. They had two judges, mm -hmm. Burton Laub, and Judge Roberts. Mm -hmm. At that time, my preceptor, when you were in in the law back then, mm -hmm. you had to have someone who was already in the law for several years mm -hmm. to be what's called your mentor. They called it a preceptor. Mm -hmm. And mine was a good friend of my parents, mm -hmm. and he became a, a wonderful friend of mine, George I. Bloom, mm -hmm. who was considered Mr. Republican mm -hmm. of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And he was my preceptor. He was a lawyer, of course. And uh, he was able, while I was at law school, help me, got, get, help me to get jobs in mm -hmm. Philadelphia in the summer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I worked for a big firm there, Nate Richter, who was that time the, considered the biggest personal injury lawyer in the Northeast, in the East. Mm -hmm. And Melvin Belli was the biggest injury lawyer in the West Coast mm -hmm. and Nate offered me a wonderful job mm -hmm. and this is just how things happen. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the students, one of our project is having them, we were in charge of the mock trials yes. and then we would use Dickinson College uh, students to be on the jury mm -hmm. and if people know about mock trials that's where you're given the facts mm -hmm and you're told which side you're on, either prosecution or defense. Mm -hmm. They're criminal cases. And the last thing I thought I would ever do was criminal work and I was, 10 days before this mock trial was gonna go on, there were several of them, since I was president of the student body at Dickinson Law and of the school, mm -hmm. the person who was a, one, the, the chief of the defense of this one case got, uh, got ill mm -hmm. and couldn't do it mm -hmm. and had to leave school. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
as presidents, I was trying to find someone to take over. There's, mm -hmm. They had been studying this thing for a long time. Yes. No one would do it, but there were six, seven other lawyers, you know, seven other lawyers from our class. and so, so I just said, look, I'll study this. I'll do it. Mm -hmm. So I became a defense lawyer in that. So your first foray into criminal defense. Yeah, and we lost the case. We didn't have good facts. <laughs> Usually. <laughs> but we did a good job. Yeah. And it just so happened, Arlen Specter, his first elected position mm -hmm. was district attorney of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And he was testifying before the state senate on some legal bills. And I had heard that he was going to be in Harrisburg. Mm -hmm. So just by chance, I called him. I didn't talk with him directly, but uh, the lady who handled his, all of his appointments, and I told her, we know he's going to be here. We would love if he would come over to the law school and maybe speak. And uh, I see he's speaking at 9.30 in the morning. Uh, unless he has other commitments, maybe he would speak to us over lunch, mm -hmm. and I'll get everybody together. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, let me get back to you. And uh, she said, came back and said, oh, Mr. Spector just can't fit it in. Mm -hmm. But thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So I called George Bloom, mm -hmm. who's Mr. Republican, and I said to, I told him, he said, let me call Arlen. <laughs> so he called Arlen. Next thing I knew, I got a call from this guy. He said, uh, Arlen has opened up a time and he's going to speak there over lunch. Mm -hmm. So I got him to come over lunch. Mm -hmm. And you know how hard it is to get law students over in lunch to come to his speech? Indeed. But I really worked hard. Mm -hmm. Because he wasn't that known yet. Mm -hmm. He was brilliant, of course, and mm -hmm. different. And he, uh, he spoke and got people, not just about criminal law, but about the law, mm -hmm. and got Every student was so glad they were there to listen to him speak. Mm -hmm. And then there was a horrible snowstorm. Mm -hmm. There were no cell phones back then. There were none of that. Mm -hmm. You couldn't move out of Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. You couldn't move anywhere. So he was stuck in Carlisle. Mm -hmm. So Staying Dean Laub, what? So <laughs> Dean Laub uh -huh. said to Arlen, "Look, just stay here tonight. You'll stay with. At, they had a home about two blocks away. Mm -hmm. You'll stay with us." Uh, Laub had been a judge in Erie County, as I said. Mm -hmm. He was made the dean of the Dickinson School of Law. Mm -hmm. And Judge Roberts, who was sat on that bench, mm -hmm. he was made, uh, Bill Scranton appointed him to fill an unexpired term on the Supreme Court. Okay. And he went on to win that. Mm -hmm. They were two great men. Mm -hmm. And Burton and Laub got Dickinson Law School. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, so he stayed with the Laubs mm -hmm. and Burton Laub said to him, you know, we have a mock trial tonight, and we have uh, faculty members who sit as judges. Mm -hmm. I'm sure none of them would be upset. Would you want to sit tonight mm -hmm. and watch a criminal trial, a mock trial? He said, yeah, oh, that'd be fun. So lo and behold, he was there. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I had met him over lunch and be talking to him. Mm -hmm. He didn't know, and I had no idea I'd be in this thing. Yes. So he was there that night mm -hmm. and we went through and we lost. Mm -hmm. The jury found against us. Mm -hmm. And then he started talking to each one of the people and Giving told them about what he saw as pluses and minuses. Mm -hmm. And you want to hear the honest thing. Mm -hmm. And that's what Arlen was all about. And he told us that. And then when I was, he said, Corky, you did a really great job. You know, I understand you only had these facts 10 days ago. I said, well, I tried. He said, no, really good. He said, and by the way, uh, I would like to talk to you after, you know. So it was over, and there was like a little reception for mm -hmm. everybody, and then I went to talk to him, and he said, Quirky, I'd like you to come to work at the district attorney's office. You know, one of those things that just you get that call or something. That's right, He's, all because of a snowstorm. You know, how it happened, and he mm -hmm. said, no, I've been checking up about you talking to Dean Laub, and I know you have a job mm -hmm. with Nate Richter, but I think you'd do great as a prosecutor mm -hmm. in my office. Mm -hmm. So I asked him how much he could pay, 
if I knew they weren't paying much. Now I'm really dating myself because this is back in 19. 58, mm -hmm. 59, no, I'm sorry, 1963. Uh, yes, okay. And he said, uh, we can pay $6,100. Mm -hmm. A year. <laughs> yeah. Oh so I gosh. said, Mr. Spector, I think that's great, mm -hmm. but $6,100, how can I live down there? He said, well, there's some other young people coming in, maybe you could live with one of them or whatever. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, where were you going to live when you were going to work for Nate Richter? Now, Nate Richter was in private work, mm -hmm. the biggest personal injury lawyer around, and mm -hmm. he had a big firm, plus he was very, very wealthy mm -hmm. on the main line in Philadelphia, and he had a big pool and a pool house mm -hmm. above the thing. Mm -hmm. And I said, Nate Richter was going to let me stay in his in the pool, house. pool house. So... He said, why don't you call Nate and see if he'll still let you stay in the pool house. Oh, my goodness. So I did call Nate. Mm -hmm. And he finally got back. I, and he said, I want, I'm glad you're taking this job. Rather than stay there for about three or four years, mm -hmm. then you'll come with me. Mm -hmm. I said, my problem, Mr. Richter, is I, I don't know if I can do that about my living arrangements. He said, no, no, you're going to still be able to stay at the... Pool house. At the pool house. I've stayed there for almost four years at that pool house. Oh my God. Free of charge, which was beautiful. Mm -hmm. And was invited to all the parties that Nate Richter had. But anyway. That's a it, really good way to network. Yeah. Okay. No one's ever accused me of not being a good networker. <laughs> I think that's right. <laughs> but I have. Uh, I loved working with Arlen, mm -hmm. and he was brilliant. And the DA's office, even back then, was about 90 uh, deputy mm -hmm. DAs. Mm -hmm. But when he ran it, it was considered one of the most effective and best district attorney's office in the country. Mm -hmm. yeah. He got very big name, and uh, uh, it was during that time when, uh, at some point after that, when uh, John Kennedy was assassinated. Mm -hmm. And he was named the chief investigator mm -hmm. of the Warren Commission. Mm -hmm. I did not know that. Yeah, and that's how he got into politics. Mm -hmm. And he did the Warren Commission. He was on television all the time nationally. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how his career began to move all the way up as it did. Mm -hmm. But uh, so I loved it. And after about two or three years, I was thinking, you know, maybe it's time now for me to move on with Nate Richter. Mm -hmm in personal injury. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't you know it, things happen in life. Mm -hmm. Nate Richter, when I was thinking about it, I had heard that Nate Richter had unfortunately died of a massive heart attack. Mm -hmm. and I went to that funeral and I talked to his wife and talked to a lot of his other people about Nate. And And then I went and paid a condolence call, and two of the partners who were mm -hmm. going to take over, who became major personal injury lawyers in uh, Philadelphia, said, we'd still like you to come with me, mm -hmm. come with us. And I just said, you know, without Nate, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And that's when I got the offer to come back to Harrisburg. Okay. They got the grant mm -hmm. to... Uh, from the federal government. It was under Lyndon Johnson then, mm -hmm. called the Office of Economic Opportunity. Mm -hmm. He started that. Mm -hmm. And they started the OEO project and Head Start, mm -hmm. uh, community action committees, legal services mm -hmm. for the poor, mm -hmm. in civil work. Mm -hmm. And Dauphin County was very much ahead mm -hmm. of the counties around here. In Dauphin County, uh, Larry Adler, mm -hmm was the chairman of that committee, mm -hmm. who was a wonderful lawyer and a, sorry we lost him, but mm -hmm. Larry uh, and Arthur Frankston, who was also a professor at Dickinson mm -hmm. School of Law, mm -hmm. uh, but lived in Harrisburg and he was a wonderful man, they filed for this grant mm -hmm. in Washington to be, get a legal service project. Mm -hmm. So this would have been the first entree of legal services into Dauphin County. Right. Mm -hmm. And into actually central, central Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. So we got 
at that time, federal funds, mm -hmm. and then it had to be matched by in-kind contribution. Mm -hmm. And this building where you're interviewing me now was not bought yet. Mm -hmm. We were on uh, right across the street mm -hmm. from the uh, Dauphin County Courthouse. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm, there was a building there that was that was where the bar association had a one floor mm -hmm. space mm -hmm. and that's where legal services was going to be mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so I took on the job and um, you must remember also this is before that big case Gideon versus yes. Wainwright right. which assured mm -hmm. that men and women who were defendants in criminal cases, mm -hmm. if they couldn't afford counsel, they have to be given counsel. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, if the public defender's office couldn't represent, they could only represent one, mm -hmm. then there had to be contract lawyers who would become, so people were represented there. Mm -hmm. But they weren't represented in the uh, civil area. Cases. And unfortunately back then, uh, when I came back, this is before Gideon versus Wainwright. Mm -hmm. uh, we did civil work, mm -hmm. but there was a wonderful man by the name of Sebastian Natal, mm -hmm. Rose Natal's husband, yes, the first who lady was a private Gavin lawyer, County. who also was uh, the federal magistrate for the federal courts here for the Middle District. Mm -hmm. But uh, Judge Nat he became Judge Natal, but yes. Judge. Mm -hmm. Natal before that, he was the man who uh, was the, pu the only public defender, and that was part-time, mm -hmm. which you can hardly believe. He was, it was a part-time job mm -hmm. because he had his own practice and he had uh, the federal magistrate job, mm -hmm. uh, and he did that. But he couldn't do summary cases, and back then it was when there was a lot of uh, racial unrest in the country mm -hmm. and there was all kinds of uh, things going on protesting which went too far in some cases mm -hmm. and uh, because we were set up in legal services he asked us if we would do the summary cases mm -hmm. for example if someone got arrested for disorderly conduct or or some other kind of charge mm -hmm. a summary trial so we were doing those criminal cases. Mm -hmm. First it was myself. Mm -hmm. My first hire was Angelo Scarlatis, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who was a good, we went to law school together. Mm -hmm. And Angelo, uh, I brought back from another county. Mm -hmm. And he was the first assistant to me. I was executive director. Mm -hmm. uh, my pay was $12,000 a year. Mm -hmm. And Double that was- what you made in Philadelphia. What? Double. Yeah, and Angelo, and then we had another spot, mm -hmm. and I hired Steve Crone, mm -hmm. attorney Steve Crone, mm -hmm. who made his whole life there. Exactly. Because uh, I had I I went on after four and a half years, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Angelo had had left and, and gone with uh, a firm, mm -hmm. and uh, then Steve decided to stay. Mm -hmm. And just, I know this is just to make sure people understand, that was the founding of all this. Yes. And what we have today in central Pennsylvania mm -hmm. and all is mid-pen legal services, mm -hmm. funded differently, mm -hmm. but doing the same things that we were doing back then, mm -hmm. but no criminal work, and even the summary. Right. But so I'm very proud of that, mm -hmm. that we started that. Mm -hmm. And I made a big mistake when I started. I thought if we just said we were open, that people would come, yes. low-income people would come. Mm -hmm. But many low-income people felt that it was just window dressing. Mm -hmm. and I had to go out and at night, and we had meetings and talking with parents and mm -hmm. going to the schools mm -hmm. and talking that we were, we were available right. if people qualified. And little by little, they started to come in and realize that we really meant business and we were going to fight for them. Because mm -hmm. they always, they thought that, well, this is just to look good. Mm -hmm. But we really did a good job. In fact, I had a, a major argument with uh, two judges one time. I think we got a little bit too uh, aggressive. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, they came around because it was a new thing. Yes. And people weren't used to yes. free legal service. They thought that 
we're going to take business away yeah, from the from other lawyers. But yeah. that wasn't the case. Absolutely. So not. that that was that we started with that, and uh, I stayed there four and a half years, mm -hmm. and of there were several hundred of these uh, programs throughout the country, mm -hmm. in big cities like Chicago, mm -hmm. uh, New York City, and in Los Angeles, and then in smaller places as well. Mm -hmm. But every year, the Corporation for uh, Legal Services in New York, mm -hmm. under the OEO project, gave out an award for the 10 most effective legal service projects mm -hmm. in the United States. And out of the four and a half years I was here, we won that twice. We were in the top 10. Congratulations. So I was, that made me very proud. Absolutely. Because we also set up teaching programs in all the schools mm -hmm. in central Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Uh, all over Dauphin County and some even outside of Dauphin County mm -hmm. teaching the law mm -hmm. and I wrote this program up and we taught law in the schools and uh, I'm proud to say that that became a template for other programs mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and also WITF TV mm -hmm. the public television station here mm -hmm. uh, liked the program so much mm -hmm. so they got Howard Miller who was uh, uh, a brilliant attorney and professor at Harvard Law mm -hmm. to do teaching. They had kids on uh, rafters, mm -hmm. you know, sitting there, and he was teaching them about the law. Mm -hmm. And I wrote the, the programming for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you're. I wanted Howard Miller's job, but the, the, he was so much better than me. But they had. Howard Miller was great. Mm -hmm. And we did that. And actually, there's an insert in the Sunday papers that still exists. It's called Parade Magazine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was a huge article in Parade Magazine mm -hmm. about this teaching program. Is really and mm -hmm. uh, I was interviewed by them about that. I was real mm -hmm. proud of that mm -hmm. because it's amazing how many people, young people, mm -hmm didn't understand the law right. yes. and we went into the schools mm -hmm. and we talked about to that with them mm -hmm. and at, their th level. at their level mm -hmm. 12th grade 10th grade mm -hmm. and then that's when in law day they started to have speaking programs yes. after that but we were in there doing these programs and mm -hmm. we we're excited very, about very that and up. then uh, after I left Dick after I left uh, legal services. Mm -hmm. I thought it was time for new blood. Mm -hmm. And uh, Milton Schapp had just been named governor of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And uh, the insurance commissioner of Pennsylvania was a man who had the Loman chair professorship of lawyer named uh, Denenberg, mm -hmm. Dr. Denenberg. And uh, Denenberg and I knew each other mm -hmm. because we were on panels at University of Pennsylvania on, uh, he, he had the Loman Chair Professorship, but mm -hmm. he taught insurance, but he was a consumer guy. Mm -hmm. And I was on trying to, we were representing people who we felt were not being treated fairly in insurance kind of claims. Mm -hmm. So he asked me to come up as Chief Deputy Insurance Commissioner mm -hmm. of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. That's why I was 28. And I did that. Mm -hmm for a couple of years and uh, that's when we, with Herb Denenberg, we wrote the bill for no fault automobile insurance mm -hmm. in Pennsylvania and I used to speak about that and debate that throughout Pennsylvania at different bar associations and that was hard because mm -hmm. some of the people who were debating against me back then were some of your top personal injury lawyers in the entire state mm -hmm. but eventually it sold and I think mm -hmm. it was accepted. Mm -hmm. And then uh, after I left there, I went into private practice mm -hmm. and did family law and criminal law. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I went on, the, I was elected to the Harrisburg School Board, mm -hmm. to Harrisburg City Council. Mm -hmm. Well, you well, know this city well. And yeah, and then they an made asset. me city solicitor. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about the radio program. 
many people know you that are not lawyers and are not part of the legal community because they know your voice. Right. And it's from the radio program. Right. Well, I had two. Mm -hmm. One was on uh, WHP mm -hmm. back then, and Paul Baker was the guy on there, a wonderful, wonderful man. He passed away too young. And, but Paul and I had a program. It was called Ask the Lawyer. Mm -hmm. And I'd come on live, mm -hmm. and people would call in mm -hmm. and ask legal questions, mm -hmm. and I would answer them if I could. I made it a point that no people who called in, mm -hmm. uh, if, they, if that's where they, but I would never take cases from the radio. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I gave answers, mm -hmm. and uh, if I didn't know, I mm -hmm. would tell them Point that them I, the right direction. I will, I gave them the best advice I could, and. Mm -hmm. Some people were from, you know, WHP had a huge audience mm -hmm. outside of Dolphin. Mm -hmm. And I had them go to their bar association and talk to their lawyer's referral. Mm -hmm. The other program that most people remember was, it happened on a Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. The biggest station in this area at that time was uh, Wink 104 mm -hmm. FM. And their big uh, shock jock was Bruce Bond, mm -hmm. who was like a Howard Stern at that time. And mm -hmm. he said, Corky, let's do a legal show, like on a Sunday morning from 7 to 9, mm -hmm. once a month. And I said, OK, we'll do it. And I went there that first Sunday, and I, I figured, who's going to be calling at 7 o'clock in the morning? We go in there. And it's about 20 to 7. I said, Bruce, what are we going to call this show? He said, how about just Corky's Court? Oh, excellent. So he called yep. it Corky's Court. And I already saw, like, nine lines were lit up. Mm -hmm. From 7 to 9, there were so many people. Mm -hmm. Calling for advice. And I, and I really tried hard, no matter how, how sometimes silly maybe I thought the question was mm -hmm. to always answer people mm -hmm. and and in their so they could understand and put them on the right track mm -hmm. and Bruce would always try and he was the joke part of it mm -hmm. you know what I mean and which made it kind of fun mm -hmm. but one time and I have to tell you this story real quick a man calls up and he's living uh, way uptown at the end of Dauphin County mm -hmm. and he said uh, Corky, we didn't have screeners. Mm -hmm. He said, Corky, um, I have this uh, company that's coming across. They want to put a, an oil line right over my, my property. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, I, I don't know if I have to get a lawyer or what, but I want to, uh, and I knew he meant the word compensated. Mm -hmm. But he said, how can I get constipated? <laughs> <laughs> okay? And I said, how can you what? He said, I wanted to make sure. He said, constipated. So he's so I'm thinking for a while, and I wanted to give a, a but something in me clicked in, and I just said, well, that really depends upon where they put the pipe. <laughs> so this, of course, went all over. <laughs> And I was walking down the street for, oh, months, and people would say, hey, Quirky, where did you put that pipe? You know, something like that. But we had so many listeners, mm -hmm. and we helped a lot of people, and uh, got a lot of people on the way, and uh, I enjoyed that. I w never accepted any pay for that, and then we really got started with Ask the Lawyer from Dauphin County yes. Bar, yes. and actually that was really started mm -hmm. by Rose Placey. Yes. Dick Placey's wife, mm -hmm. may she rest in peace. Mm -hmm. Lovely, Lovely lady, lady mm -hmm. worked hard. Mm -hmm. for the, at that time, I don't know what it was called. I don't know what they called it, whether it was the auxiliary or whatever. It was the auxiliary, yes. And uh, as with most associations, there were auxiliary sides of the medical association, the dental association, the bar association. And but of course, by, at that time, the auxiliary mm -hmm. was all ladies, because exactly. there weren't that mm -hmm. many ladies that's in right. the practice of law, which fortunately has changed, Very and that so. ceiling has mm -hmm. been broken. Mm -hmm. But she was great, and we had asked the lawyer, mm -hmm. run by the bar association. Uh, this was even before you had oh, came much, on board. Yeah, much long, much and we had asked the lawyer one uh, 
and we would sit there for a week mm -hmm. over the you know at different strawberry places square. yeah and then yeah. when strawberry square was built that's where we did it mm -hmm. and uh it became a really nice program mm -hmm. and it feels and, and and i think i've said this before you know that people don't realize mm -hmm. how some people have to live mm -hmm. without enough money let's say to daily mm -hmm. and they're taken advantage of too and they don't have sometimes the way to go mm -hmm. and that's where legal services mid pen comes in today Absolutely. and that's where all the volunteers mm -hmm. all of our pro, of, bono, of pro work. bono work mm -hmm. uh, I always thought that was so important mm -hmm. and while you're mentioning that Corky I know you're very involved in our pro bono program talk a little bit more about that well, pro bono, so people know, is free legal service, not for people who can afford to have their own attorney, mm -hmm. but free legal service for people who just can't afford. And everyone, not everyone, but most people know, having a lawyer is not going to ensure you winning any case, mm -hmm. but it does give you the opportunity for a possible level, a level field. Exactly. You know, whether it's in criminal law mm -hmm. and particularly in civil law, mm -hmm. these people who might uh, be tenants and they have a problem, they have uh, almost uninhabitable type of places mm -hmm. and the landlord is uh, not fixing it up and throwing them out, what, what, what can they do mm -hmm. giving help to them? Mm -hmm. We have people who, uh, are in the midst of custody cases, mm -hmm. which are so big today. Mm -hmm. And what's more important to almost everybody are their children. Exactly. And they want to fight for their kids. Mm -hmm. But without, with the one side having representation mm -hmm. and the other side not, yes, there can be a conciliator and then there can be a judge. But to get your story out, to get your reasons out, mm -hmm. you really need someone exactly. who has some understanding of advocacy mm -hmm. who could advocate for you mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's what pro bono work is and Dauphin County has always been known to do that and even more so today mm -hmm. yes, you were here and well. you, for so long and you saw how the pro bono mm -hmm. and that the judges mm -hmm. Appreciate particularly that. you know uh, whether it was John Cherry or Rich Lewis or any of them they loved mm -hmm. to see and pushed and Todd Hoover mm -hmm. pushing yes. to get yes. lawyers to give a little bit of their time and give it as strongly and as effectively as if the person was paying you Absolutely. and we have that in Dauphin County and I think we're known for that throughout Pennsylvania Absolutely. and uh, I think, and you have found it incredibly fulfilling. Yeah, and the thing what happened is that those people who are just honed in on earning money, mm -hmm. and I understand that. That's what they went to law school. They're earning money. Mm -hmm. They're doing their job. Should they, and they have a family, do they take off to work freely? Mm -hmm. Well, as they get older, Mm -hmm. They can start smaller, and as they have more time, their kids are a little bit more grown. They can give that time, and I know, and you have now, which we didn't have back then, uh, someone like a Sandy Ballard who heads public service, mm -hmm. and Lori Furrow, and someone there that the bar can st steer them. Yes. And Sandy sets up these different programs yes. Yes. for custody yeah. cases, yeah. for example, and. Mm -hmm how to file it clinics. and do that so yeah. I'm very proud not just of being a lawyer mm -hmm. but proud of being a member of Dauphin County Bar because a lot of people outside of the bar don't know that and even some people in the bar don't know that but the Bar Association is such a great service not just to the lawyers in, mm -hmm. in, in networking and understanding and camaraderie and other things but and and continuing legal education classes but outreaching to the community yes, yes. and this bar association has always been an outreach to them and I would say it's not because you're sitting there when you were here 
that outreach, you made it even more effective because you, as an executive director, reached out to the community. Well, Corky, I appreciate no, that. No, but you did. But it was a job, a job that I loved, and for uh, lawyers that I love working with, and for a community that's very meaningful for me. And so I think that continuing that uh, will hopefully be a big part of the Dauphin County Bar Association's mission. Give me a little bit of a taste of what kind of advice you might have for young lawyers today. Well, number one, I think people who, there are a lot of people who go to law school mm -hmm. and decide that I don't want to practice. Mm -hmm. And going to law school, if somehow you can afford it or take loans, I feel is even better than getting a master's in certain things. Going to law school will prepare you for anything. Many, many, many. You know, you don't have to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. You might want to go into business. You might want to do this. But having that law degree is just something, besides learning the law, mm -hmm. you learn how to think. Exactly. And which is very important because. Problem solved. Yeah, because I wasn't, you know, at Penn State, you're, you learn subjects and things, mm -hmm. but I really learned how to think and how to mm -hmm. do and advocate mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my advice to young lawyers is don't be so insular mm -hmm. that you just go to work, work, and come home. Mm -hmm. Get involved in the community, mm -hmm. not just because it will help your practice, mm -hmm. but it's so good to have lawyers involved in in the school boards, yes. in township, being a town, or even being a solicitor mm -hmm. for a school where you would get paid, mm -hmm. but there's volunteer work, and then there's such great uh, the cancer uh, foundation and the mm -hmm. diabetes. There's just so many of these Causes disease boards where they from. could be involved in, and they get to know a lot of people, mm -hmm. and it's good to know what's going on in the world, yes. other than just your tunnel vision. Mm -hmm. Plus, you're helping a lot of people. And don't forget, and I tell this to young people, is why you, what's really important about going to law school is, yes, making a nice living, mm -hmm. but remembering that you're part of a community, and because of the expertise you have gained, you have a responsibility mm -hmm. to reach out to those who cannot somehow get a lawyer to represent them in a very complicated uh, situation. The criminal justice system and the civil justice system of the law mm. for many people is like a another language, mm -hmm. another thing, they don't know what's going on, mm -hmm. how it gets there, if they haven't been involved. They need direction mm -hmm. and they need lawyers who deal in that field, be it criminal or civil, to help them understand, because when they have a problem, if they they need that kind of expertise to help them move along mm -hmm. and maybe uh, be successful, mm -hmm. but at least to have a chance mm -hmm. to get their case across. Absolutely. So I, I'd say to young lawyers, do that, mm -hmm. and I'm going to tell you, as much as you're helping people, mm -hmm. you're helping yourself mm -hmm. to become a better person. Mm -hmm. I think that has made me better understanding and a better person to understand everybody doesn't have the same kind of, of gifts mm -hmm. that I've been given and I know that you know uh, when I say gifts I mean being coming to a family where there were funds to send me to school being able to go to school mm -hmm. being able to do this and then we have people who didn't have that kind of a home life, mm -hmm. they didn't have anything, and they just don't have a shot at life. Mm -hmm. And just because you're there doesn't mean you're gonna have, you have to have people helping you. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's hard out there. Yes. It's hard getting jobs, it's hard to stay maintaining a family. Mm -hmm. And when you have legal issues, mm -hmm. Makes it you even need help. Corky, one thing that I've known you for and I appreciate and I appreciated this in my role as executive director is your willingness to reach out to young new lawyers. And so the advice that you give them that you just mentioned 
is so helpful, but you are also um, walking the walk and you are providing them with information and, and that's so helpful for young lawyers because we all need mentors when we're uh, charting our path. And, and I will tell you one thing real quick is that I was interviewing a young man for a job mm -hmm. recently and a uh, young lawyer who happened to graduate from Harvard Law School, mm -hmm. a wonderful law school. Mm -hmm. Looked wonderful on paper, mm -hmm. everything he did. And I'm interviewing him and while I'm talking with him, Judge Richard Lewis from the Dauphin County Bar, the president judge, mm -hmm. they called in to say, uh, Mr. Goldstein, Judge Lewis is on the phone. He has three other, we had a case in two days. He just wants to talk to everybody on the phone mm -hmm. about one issue. He said, it'll only be a few minutes. So I said to this young man, will you excuse me? He said, I said you don't have to leave, you can sit there. I just have to take this call. Mm -hmm. So I was on the call. Okay, I'm in on that, that's fine, boom. And then I went back and I look and he's sitting there. Remember, this is a, a very well-educated young man, very well-dressed, interviewing for a job. Mm -hmm. And I see that he's texting mm -hmm. on his phone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now I hung up the phone and I'm done and he's still texting. So I just said, I'll wait for you. And then he, he I thought by then he would just stop, mm -hmm. but he kept texting. Mm -hmm. And then when he was done, I just said to him, what was all that about? Well, I had to text these guys that I'm supposed to meet for a, a beer and you know, something to eat in a little while. And I just wanted them to know I'd be a little late. I said, let me tell you something. You're very bright. I looked at your grades. I looked at everything. If you want a job, okay, you don't come in here with your phone or you turn your phone off for the time that we're having the interview, demonstrate to me that you really want this job. Mm -hmm. I've interviewed a lot of people for this. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, does that mean I'm not going to get the job? I said, no, I don't know yet. I'm just saying to you, for future when you interview, demonstrate to the first people you're interviewing with that this is what you want to do, because I know this is what you want to do, mm -hmm. and how hard you worked at Harvard, and this is the kind of work you want to do and do that. So they have a feeling of confidence mm -hmm. in you, not just what they see on the paper, what they see from you. Mm -hmm. and, I, and he said, well, what kind of advice are you giving me? I said. Next time you go in for an interview, leave your phone outside. Mm -hmm. In your pocket, in your overcoat. So anyway, in the new world, we have young people today. Mm -hmm. And I realize that many of the young men, for example, mm -hmm. are pitching in a lot more in the raising of kids, mm -hmm. right there mm -hmm. with their wives or if, in any relationship that they have. Mm -hmm. And we have so many young women now in the law mm -hmm. who have to Juggling work there, organize everything. Mm -hmm. So both have to work together, and I understand that. And they are doing that. The young lawyers who are married or in a relationship and might have kids, mm -hmm. uh, whatever, they have to balance that. Mm -hmm. And that's where people get into trouble in, in, in any field when they don't have a balance. Mm -hmm. they, they, they just get out of kilter. Mm -hmm. Always keep re-examining mm -hmm. your relationships and your work, and so you do all that work. Um, but don't forget, as you move along, you can do volunteer things mm -hmm. with your kids. Mm -hmm. You can go to a homeless shelter to help give out food mm -hmm. on some part of the day of Thanksgiving mm -hmm. with your kids mm -hmm. so they can see how other people have to live mm -hmm. and they can begin to have and understand how important it is to give of yourself Absolutely. from learn from your that's what I would mm -hmm. tell them mm -hmm. your kids don't have to stay home mm -hmm. you do it together as a family project mm -hmm. so the kids see what you're doing and then they'll begin to feel that way mm -hmm. and learn from that yeah and that's what I would say about but don't go into the law 
because it looks sexy and it looks uh, like that when you watch it on television. Yes, very different. Because it's a lot, don't get me wrong, some days are a little crazy. However, it's nothing like it is on television right. where they can start a case and an hour later the case is over. Exactly. You know, but in the real life there's times that are going to be tough. Mm -hmm. it's gonna be and dry. always remember that you're an officer of the court mm -hmm. and that you have to, you want to treat your clients mm -hmm. as if they were very important, mm -hmm. continue to communicate with them, mm -hmm. and get to know the other men and women in the bar. Yes. And uh, stay with it throughout your career. Mm -hmm. Last thing I would say is, I'm 78 now, mm -hmm. and most of the people my age who were fortunate enough to live this long or whatever, many have already uh, passed away or very sick, and others have retired, they had the funds to do it, and they're doing it, and they're doing well. Mm -hmm. But there's many mm -hmm. who retire who aren't doing well. Mm -hmm. Mentally, I mean, I'm not saying they're insane, but they just, mm -hmm. they've lost their... But so if you retire, have a plan mm -hmm. of what you're going to do, and you could do a lot of pro bono work, your mind is still good, and you can come and get in touch with your bar association mm -hmm. and say, how can I help? How I can do this. Mm -hmm. You know, my mind is good. I can still mm -hmm. do some work. And mm -hmm. you'll stay sharp and you'll enjoy it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, it's a lifetime of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so someone will say to me, Quirky, why don't you retire? And my wife knows me, and I think you know me, that I would not do well. Exactly. You know, I would not do well because... That's just who I am. Busy and a creator and a doer um, your whole life. Courtney. Yeah. Now, mentally and physically, if I can't do it, mm -hmm. then I can't do it. But mm -hmm. as long as I can do it, yeah. mentally and physically, I, I want to continue being involved in life. Mm -hmm. But everybody, and I told this to actually one of the younger, outstanding criminal defense lawyers in town, Brian Freeman. Mm -hmm. Uh, not Brian Freeman, Brian, well, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, anyway, but I said to Brian, um, they saw me coming in the courtroom and I said, they said, Quirky, when we see you, Brian Perry. we remind us that we have to get, we have to get an exit strategy. Mm -hmm. Because none of us are going to be here when we're in our 70s. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, you can't make that decision now to all of you. Mm -hmm. Life does different things and you might change your mind. Mm -hmm. Certainly don't stay in it when you feel you don't want to do it anymore or you're done with it, you're burnt out or whatever. But uh, take each day mm -hmm. and just remember, you'll always be a lawyer. Yes. And even when maybe you can't do the... The full-time work, you mm -hmm. can still do mm -hmm. some volunteer mm -hmm. pro bono that others can't do, and you're needed. Yeah, absolutely. So um, that's what I've had. I, I, I will tell you this. If I had a minute to talk about my life, mm -hmm. I was, I've been really blessed mm -hmm. with a wife and two kids and two having kids. a good, uh, and my wife worked her to our time marriage and what she loved. Mm -hmm. And did I have some bumps along the way? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And did I have some tough times? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you just have to keep... Mm -hmm. I once said to my daughter in the closing, I said to... They were like nine and ten or whatever, both the girls, and I forget. And my one daughter, extremely smart, who's now a medical doctor, she said, Dad, I studied so hard for that test. Mm -hmm. She got all, always got A's. Mm -hmm. She got a C. Mm -hmm. She said, it's just life. She says, it is fair. Life, you know, someone said that she said, life isn't fair. I said, let me tell you something to both of you. Life isn't fair. Mm -hmm. I don't want to hear it anymore. It's never going to be fair. Is it fair for Lori, your, the, the girl that you're good friends with, who's in your class? 
who, God forbid, was just diagnosed with cancer. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. So I said, you've got to remember it isn't. But that doesn't mean you don't keep going. Learn from your, yes. the biggest learning tools are from your mistakes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if you're honest, mm -hmm. not from your successes. Mm -hmm. and, that's, and I've tried to drill that into them, mm -hmm. and both my girls have done well. And uh, Listen to that message. So, you know, I hope so, yeah. you know. When they're home, mm -hmm. maybe I did a little too much because I think about when they get out, and you've got to prepare them for the world yes. and how to take care of things. If you do everything for them, mm -hmm. they're not going to know what to do. They learn that sense of independence. But I want to thank you for everything you've done for this bar. Oh, Corky. Because I've seen the thank executive directors way, way back mm -hmm. when I first started practicing. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying they weren't nice or they weren't good. But you took it to a whole new level. Well, it was a and I want to I thank you for that as part of a lawyer in this community. They made many, many good friends in this bar Well, they feel, they love you and feel close to you. But I'm happy for you because you're near your, you and your husband are near your grandchildren, mm -hmm. your kids. Mm -hmm. And I know how much you love that, mm -hmm. you know. Very much so. Uh, I miss so. everyone here, absolutely, but uh, Well, you didn't see, nice the thing I'm saying, even though you so. have somewhat retired from mm -hmm. full-time mm -hmm. you've made it a position that I'm going to stay active yes. and you're still doing things in, for Widener Law School mm -hmm. and other things that you do mm -hmm. because and that's is, you. Again a part of what I, I, who we are I think when we have these law degrees and we feel like we want to continue to learn every day no matter what capacity that might be in so Corky thank you. It's thank you pleasure. very much. You are a big part of our legal community and a strong supporter of the Dauphin County Bar Association, and I appreciate that very Thank much. Thank you very much. Okay.